morning, everybody. It is it is a wonderful morning here in Olathe, Kansas, and I am very happy uh, to join you here, as as Yasmin mentioned, to talk about Sam.gov, everybody's favorite topic, uh, especially lately. Uh, if if you are a federal government contractor, I am sure you are no doubt familiar with Sam.gov. Uh, and and quite frankly, some of the headaches that uh, uh, can can come from it, um, especially lately. But uh, so so it's a a wonderful chance to join you here today to talk about this topic. I am Man Matthew Schoonover. I am the managing member of Schoonover and Moriarty. We are a Kansas City-based law firm that works with federal government contractors, primarily small businesses, but exclusively with federal government contractors on a lot of the fun issues that come from working with the federal government. And as part of that, uh, we, we do uh, talk with folks about uh, uh, the importance of SAM.gov and uh, 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 creating and updating their SAM.gov profile in order to be eligible for federal government contracts. I will say though, that although I am an attorney, uh, and although this is my face on the screen here, by the way, that's that's what I actually look like. I was talking to Yasmin before we uh, before we joined. We just moved offices this week, um, and uh, this is my first event on camera uh, since we have moved offices. And I'm still waiting for blinds behind me, so uh, I'm I'm backlit right now. If you can't see me uh, in the uh, in the in the chat box, that's fine. That's what I look like face face with the name. Um, I do have a light that's off uh, to the side here that is blinding me in an effort to try and get a little bit of front light. So I apologize for that um, uh, uh, visual goofiness here. Uh, but anyway, uh, even though I am an attorney, uh, please don't take today's presentation to be legal advice. These are uh, obviously specific issues for each business that may come up. And although we'll talk about uh, some of the basics of SAM.gov here today, certainly if you have any questions, I would encourage you reach out. First of all, reach out to Yasmin and her team. They do a wonderful job helping uh, small business federal government contractors, including with a lot of the questions as it comes to SAM.gov. And so I'm delighted that, that you all are, have joined today because it means that you have connected with your PTAC. And if you haven't yet taken the chance to sit down with them and better understand how they can help your business in its pursuit of federal government contracts, I do think you are missing, uh, missing out on a vital, vital resource. I always recommend to folks that they sit down with their PTAC, no matter where they are in the federal government contracting process, whether they're starting out or they're established, because the PTAC certainly has something to offer for, for everyone. Uh, so reach out to your PTEC, reach out to um, a government contracting uh, attorney. SAM.gov is one of those things that I always caution folks, you know, at the outset, let me say SAM registration is free. Um, and, and so I don't, uh, in my practice, uh, do a lot of actually registering businesses in SAM.gov because I charge for my services. And I always tell folks, listen, it's something that, that I think you should either sit down and, and, and try and square away yourself or sit down with your PTAC who can help you. Um, I will certainly help with questions as they come up, particularly with regard to what some of the things that they are offering, but don't fall into the trap of paying for a SAM.gov registration because you certainly, certainly do not need to do that. It is free. So with that, we'll talk uh, you know, about SAM.gov today, what it is and, and, and essentially what's included in SAM.gov, why it matters for federal government contractors. And then we'll take a little bit of, bit of time of talking about how you set up your SAM.gov profile. And then through that process, in addition to setting it up, also keeping it updated because there is a requirement that you keep it updated. And then we'll talk a little bit just about what SAM.gov can do for your business and how the PTAC can help you um, uh, leverage SAM.gov to compete for federal government contracts. We'll also talk a little bit about um, the latest issues with SAM.gov. I know uh, one of the hot topics in federal contracting right now is SAM is kind of broken for some folks. Um, and there's nothing that they can do but uh, about it other than wait for GSA to resolve the issues 
We'll talk a little bit about that and some good news, hopefully, um, that is that is on the horizon here. Before we break into it, I did want to give a quick plug for our blog, GovConBrief.com. On GovConBrief, we talk about a lot of these topics as they relate to small business federal government contractors. Uh, and as its name implies, we do try to keep our posts pretty brief, really just giving you the information that we think is, is pertinent for federal contractors or interesting for federal contractors. So if you haven't checked out GovCon Brief, I would certainly recommend that you do so. I hope it's a resource for you. You can subscribe for updates right there. You can also follow the firm on LinkedIn, Schoonover and Moriarty. We will um, uh, post on there our updates to GovCon Brief as well. With that, let's go ahead and break into and talk about the System for Award Management, or SAM.gov. This is when we talk about SAM.gov, again, short for System for Award Management, it is what we call the GPE, the government-wide point of entry for most federal contract opportunities. If you want to do work with uh, uh, Uncle Sam, you need to be aware of and you need to be on SAM.gov. Through that, it lists um, uh, federal government contractors. You can go on and search for uh, federal government contractors. That's where you will be um, registering your information into that's how the federal government knows that you are a federal government contractor and how um, oftentimes you'll get paid under your federal government contract. And so we'll talk about that. But SAM.gov is a very, very important website. Now, you might have heard of its predecessor, FedBizOps. Well, correction, SAM.gov actually had several different predecessors, uh, including SAM.gov. Um, but uh, essentially, uh, FedBizOps, or FBO, uh, was, was at one point the GPE for federal government contracts, or for most federal government contracts. Uh, beginning uh, in, in 2019, the federal government has started to merge information from a bunch of different websites into SAM.gov, and that includes FBO. And so now, uh, SAM.gov is the uh, government-wide point of entry for most federal government contracts and for a lot of other federal contracting information. The goal is eventually that SAM.gov will be a one-stop shop for federal contractors for all of the information that they need uh, relating to working with the federal government. But we'll see there that there are some growing pains in this goal. Here we see um, all of the sites that are basically going into SAM.gov. This graph is a little outdated because it still refers to beta.sam.gov. Beta.sam.gov, if you've heard of that, was the beta version when the government was first incorporating a bunch of these different functionalities into SAM.gov. They've dropped the beta, it's now SAM.gov, but we do see um, some of this information that is being incorporated into SAM.gov. Uh, FBO is on there, um, the original entity registration information from the original version of SAM. We see wage uh, reports from the Department of Labor. We see various past performance information and exclusion information and a lot of other things that are eventually going to be included in SAM.gov. Right now, though, we're still in that process of integrating all of these sites. And, and we do see um, kind of the latest information of where uh, GSA is. The General Services Administration is the government entity that runs or is responsible for SAM.gov. And this is the information from GSA about where we are in their integration process as of, as of today. Um, we see that assistance listings and certain past performance information are included now in SAM.gov, as are wage determinations. Updated wage determinations should be available for you in SAM.gov. However, I always encourage folks to make sure that they have a line open with their contracting officer so that they are getting wage updated wage determinations for those contracts uh, to which they apply, those that are, are subject to the Service Contract Act or the Davis-Bacon Act. 
you want to make sure that you are updating or, or getting the latest versions of the applicable wage determinations for your workers. FBO, I mentioned uh, bid opportunities, um, is now included in uh, SAM.gov as well as, as some of the original um, entity information. FPDS, which is various contract award data, is in SAM.gov. However, I will say that, that FPDS NG um, is still up and running. It still does have uh, contract information on that. And quite frankly, uh, FPDS, I, I like that little website. If you've never been on to FPDS.gov, it's a very interesting government one run website where they basically have a little Google like search bar in there and you can search for all of this different uh, uh, contract information and everything. It's a, it's, it's a very, um, what's the word, um, primitive website, but it's endearing in its own right. Uh, so if you haven't checked out FPDS, at least for grins and giggles, I, I, I recommend that you do so because there actually is a lot of great contract information available on that website. But in the future, SAM.gov will have more information than what it does now. Uh, certain subcontracting information, basically uh, funding and reporting information, if there's reporting requirements for your subcontracts, uh, that information, which is now uh, 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 sent through FSRS or ESRS, is going to be integrated into SAM.gov. Past performance and integrity reporting issues, FAPIS, is also going to be integrated into SAM.gov, as well as CPARs, your grade cards for working on a federal government contract. Right now, that information is available through the separate CPAR system. Only you and the, the contracting folks have access to that. Eventually, that will be integrated into SAM.gov. Again, still only the contractor and the contracting folks will have access to that information. CPARs um, are considered to be performance, or excuse me, procurement sensitive information, so that won't be publicly available, but that will soon be integrated into SAM.gov, or I, I will say will someday in the future be integrated into SAM.gov as the government continues to make it that one stop shop. I mentioned that SAM.gov is the government-wide point of entry for most federal government contracts. And that is, you know, that is 100% true. I will say it's not for every government contract. Um, uh, there are some information or some contracts that are, are posted separately, um, but most uh, federal opportunities are, are going to be listed through SAM.gov. But beyond that, um, this is where the government keeps track of awardee information, offeror information. Again, this is where they go to make sure that your business is eligible to do work with the federal government by having a SAM registration in there. So it will have your company's information um, as well as, uh, uh, or your registration, as well as some uh, basic information about your company. Again, this is where you're going to search for contract opportunities, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But if you're breaking into the, uh, federal contracting, I encourage you to become familiar with SAM.gov and to understand how to search for various opportunities under there. I mentioned wage determinations those are uh, now available on SAM.gov and are a very important part of any service contract, as well as um, various contract reporting data is available on SAM.gov. And so it is becoming more and more of a, an overall information repository for federal government contractors. How do you become in, uh, registered in SAM.gov? I mentioned that um, uh, essentially um, uh, every federal government contractor needs to be registered in SAM.gov. And that is, as a general proposition, true. I won't say it's an ironclad rule because there are always exceptions um, to, to most rules. Um, but SAM.gov registration is required as a baseline to be eligible for award on a federal government contract. And I will note, 
there used to be some con uh, confusion about when that uh, company had to be registered in SAM.gov. And that confusion came because of kind of dueling FAR provisions, one of which said, you have to be registered in SAM.gov at the time you submit your bid. Another provision said you have to be registered in SAM.gov at the time of the award. Well, the government has recently clarified that ambiguity. And now, and I want to I want to make this point crystal clear, you have to be registered in SAM.gov at the time you submit your bid. So get registered before you submit your bid. If you go through the process of preparing um, a proposal and submitting it under a federal contract opportunity and you're not registered in SAM.gov, that is problematic because you're not eligible for that award, asterisk. This includes joint ventures. A joint venture under SBA's regulations, a small business joint venture, is uh, essentially the combination of two or more entities where they create a separate legal entity, in most cases, that is going to bid on specific federal contract opportunities as that entity. That joint venture entity will be the prime contractor, but it will perform that work through the venturers. SBA's regulations have detailed requirements about uh, 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 what makes a compliant joint venture, and you need to make sure that you're complying with those requirements at the time you submit your bid. But the joint venture entity itself also has to be registered in SAM.gov. So keep that in mind as well. Sometimes I'll, I'll uh, receive a call from a prospective client and they'll tell me something that, hey, we've got a bid that's going in. We need your help preparing, uh, you know, getting a joint venture set up uh, uh, so that we can bid. And I'll say, great, when are you submitting the bid? And they'll say, tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. And woo! Boy, is that hard to do, um, if not impossible, because you do have to go through the SAM.gov registration process. So make sure that if you're bidding on something, whether as an individual entity or as a joint venture, before you even start working on your bid, your SAM.gov registration is up and is current um, so, so that that joint venture is eligible. Now, one of the things that uh, you might be thinking is, gee, that's great, but right now my registration is stuck. And there's a lot of contractors who are in that same boat. Essentially, through the migration process, as I understand it, and I'm, I, I was telling Yasmin earlier, I'm not, I'm not a technical person by any means, and this is all kind of second and third hand information, but as I understand it, when SAM.gov goes to verify your business through you know, the IRS or through these other websites, sometimes those websites report information differently. It could be the same information, but maybe one says spells out the word street and the other one abbreviates it, or one uses a period and the other doesn't. That causes a mismatch, and that has to go through and be verified by somebody. And right now, that process is very problematic. GSA is overwhelmed with requests, with tickets for um, verifying that information. If you, if, if you have faced this issue and you haven't yet submitted a ticket, I would certainly recommend that you do so, so it's on GSA's radar. If you have submitted a ticket, GSA says, don't submit another ticket because that'll put you at the back of the line. Um, but it is a mess uh, trying to get your entity verified in SAM.gov right now because these systems aren't talking with each other. GSA is working to fix it, but there's a lot of companies out there that, that are, are, are facing this issue, particularly after um, the UEI conversion. So uh, what can a contractor do? Well, as I mentioned, make sure that you have submitted a ticket. But if you are working with the DOD or trying to bid on a DOD contract, I will note that there is a little bit of relief in the form of a DOD class deviation. And I'm gonna see if I can share this with you now. Um, 
Here is uh, on, on September 8th, 2022, the Department of Defense issued a class deviation regarding the requirement for a business to be registered in SAM.gov at the time it submits its bid. And essentially what that, that class deviation recognizes is that right now getting in registered in SAM.gov is a mess. So what they are saying, what DOD is saying is essentially, if you can show them that you started the process prior to bid and that you are stuck in the system, you don't have to be registered until at least 30 days after the award or the date of your first invoice, whichever comes first. So they're allowing a little bit of grace for those companies that are kind of stuck in the process now. So you need to make sure that you have requested a ticket because they'll want to see that information and, and that you're going through that process to get it fixed. Now, this just came out. Um, we're not even a month out from this yet. I still, it, this is a great thing because it gives some contractors um, uh, the ability to, to get their registration fixed and not lose an award. The thing I'm not sure about is, is two things, or the things I'm not sure about are, are two. Essentially, what happens after that 30 days or the date of your first invoice? You know, you're still, as a contractor, at the mercy of GSA, approving your SAM.gov profile. But what happens then? Um, you know, if, if you've done everything that you can do and are still waiting at that point, I don't know. Um, you know, again, we haven't seen this happen yet because we're still within 30 days. Um, but there could be steps to take. I'm still kind of noodling through it. Uh, but but that's one of the big questions um, that I have about this is what happens after 30 days if if you're still stuck in SAM.gov? The other, the other question that I have is, well, what happens to those folks who have a contract and are still awaiting payment. In order to be paid, um, uh, generally, uh, the agency will pay you through the bank information that you have identified in SAM.gov. And if you're not registered in SAM.gov, well, uh, or verified in SAM.gov, that's gonna affect DOD's ability or any agency's ability to pay you under the contract. And, and weeks ago, there was an article in, I want to say it was um, Federal News Network that talked about contractors that were waiting to be paid hundreds of thousands of dollars by the agencies because of this, uh, because of SAM.gov. Um, it continues to be an issue. If you are facing issues getting paid from, con uh, from agencies because of your SAM.gov uh, listing, um, I would be happy to talk with you after this um, about ideas for that, but that continues to be an issue as well. And as I read this, this deviation, it does not address um, those issues. You know, what, both what happens next and what happens to those folks that are currently um, working with the federal government that are waiting to get paid. But keep in mind, I mean, overall, it's a good thing for agencies or excuse me, for contractors, because it at least with regards to, to DOD specific procurements, gives them a little relief as to the requirement to have a SAM.gov registration, it allows them to fight for another day or another 30 days after the award, um, more specifically. Um, I haven't seen anything yet from a civilian agency side. There might be something out there. I just don't know um, at this point. Uh, but uh, the deviation does apply to DOD specific contracts only. If you are bidding on something as um, and, and you are curious how this might affect you or how the requirement to be registered in SAM.gov might affect you, um, there potentially are some things that you can do. They might be a long shot, um, but uh, you know, there's there's at least a scintilla of hope 
um, that maybe um, something can be done on on that. Um, and again, if you have specific questions, let me know. I'd be I'd be happy to talk. So, how do you actually get registered in SAM.gov? Well, you got to go through another website, login.gov. You got to create login and user information there, and then you go to SAM.gov and you're going to follow the process for registering the entity. You're going to use the same uh, login information that you used for uh, created at login.gov. One wonders why they haven't incorporated login.gov and the sam.gov, but you know, hey, let's 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 fight the battles in front of us. Then you're going to go through the the registration entity um, thing, and you're going to have to indicate the type of entity that is being registered, um, a business and organization. Um, uh, you're also going to have to identify your the purpose for registration, and there are several different purposes. Uh, that you might select. Some have to do with grants. Uh, uh, most of you on here are probably uh, going to select the ability to bid on contracting opportunities um, for that registration. And so that uh, you'll go through that process uh, to get registered, to actually start that process. Then you're going to enter your company's what is called core data. And this is, you know, the biographic information that you would think the company would have. You would have your legal name and address. And here I would note that your legal name probably should match what your actual registered name is with the state. So uh, the company is going to get registered under state law, you know, uh, call it Maryland law. You're going to register as a Maryland limited liability company, for example. It doesn't necessarily have to be an LLC, but let's assume that you are. It's, it's um, GovCon company comma LLC is the name of your company. Very imaginative. Um, you'll go to sam.gov and you will register GovCon company comma LLC as a Maryland legal, lim uh, excuse me, limited liability company under sam.gov. You'll include your address um, for that company as well. You'll need your tax ID number um, for for that company. So yes, you will have to go through uh, the uh, uh, IRS to get a tax ID number. You also need a unique entity ID number. Now, if if this were a year ago, you would heard you would have heard me say you need a Duns number. Um, and still, folks colloquially might call it your Duns number. Now, um, though, instead of using DUNS numbers, the government uses unique entity identifiers. Um, if you are already registered in SAM, your UEI, as, as it's called, is, is going to be automatically assigned to you. Your DUNS number may still be used for like historical records and stuff like that. But now the UEI is, is that primary identification number. If you are registering for SAM in the first time, for the first time, SAM.gov will assign you a UEI as part of that registration process. And the UEI um, is basically like your car's VIN number, where your car VIN number has 17 um, uh, digits, and each digit or combination of digits means something under that number, basically what your make and model and where it was made and lot number and all of that type of stuff is in your VIN number. Your UEI is 12 digits, but it's very similar to that where each digit means something in that process. It's not just randomized. It, it, there's, there's a method to the madness in the assignment of that UEI. Um, but you'll need to put that UEI or, or get that UEI number as part of the SAM registration process. If you have a cage code, cage code still might be used um, uh, depending on, on what you're doing for the government. You'll put that in the information or in, in the core data. You will also include your bank account information. Again, I mentioned that that's where uh, the government is going to pay you. You will put your bank account information into SAM.gov as well. Um, you will include information about, well, what do you do? <laughs> what goods and services do you provide? Uh, you will designate NAICS codes 
um, including what your primary NAICS code is. A NAICS code is a North American Industry Classification System code. These are six digit codes um, that apply to basically every industry in the American economy, but it's broader than that. It's basically every industry in the North American economy. That is, there's a, uh, the, the United States, Canada, and Mexico get together every few years. They have a party and they decide uh, what are these NAICS codes? Um, six digit codes, and they apply for every industry. Now, Sometimes for small businesses, uh, what they do is they say, gosh, I wanna do work with the federal government. I don't care what it is. I just wanna do work and make money. Um, the problem, and, and, and what they'll do there is, is they'll register a ton of different NAICS codes saying, hey, I work in this different industry. My suggestion is you wanna be as inclusive as possible with, with what you do within the bounds of, of reason. There is, there is no requirement generally that a company have a certain NAICS code under its SAM.gov profile in order to be eligible for a specific federal government contract. Generally, I've seen contracting officers require that before, but that's silly. There's no reason to do that. Um, um, but I don't necessarily think and this is my personal opinion, that having dozens and dozens of, of NAICS codes on a SAM profile necessarily conveys any level of expertise um, or confidence that you do something well. Um, it's kind of a, a jack of all trades, master of none situation. I remember working with a client on a uh, size protest one time, and we pulled up the, the company's uh, profile that we were protesting, and they had listed on their on their uh, SAM profile over 100 different NAICS codes. They were a one person company and they had listed over 100 different NAICS codes saying that they do work in those businesses. I stopped counting at 102, that's no joke. There were NAICS codes relating to running a religious school, running a casino, doing IT work, doing uh, heavy construction work, everything you could think of was listed on this SAM.gov profile. And really, what does that mean? Doesn't doesn't necessarily mean any, you know, that, that the company does any work. Um, you know, so what I always tell folks is think about what you do, think about what you may want to do, and select a reasonable number of NAICS codes um that that um uh, uh, are are uh, good for your industry you can determine what the NAICS codes are you can google uh, the NAICS code manual it'll take you to the census bureau's website you want to look for the latest version of the manual and it'll walk you through what all of the different NAICS codes are including a narrative description of what's included and what's not included in those various NAICS codes. And certainly some that's something that um, uh, Yasmin and her team can help out with or your local PTAC can help out with. But I, I mentioned NAICS codes, you wanna be inclusive as possible within the bounds of reason. You're also gonna put information about your company's size and socioeconomic status. You'll put information about your revenues and, and employee numbers, and that should automatically populate um, your small business status under each of the various NAICS codes that you select. Um, a, a word there, if, if you are selecting several different NAICS codes um, and you're wondering which is your primary NAICS code, um, and it's arguable that your primary NAICS code are, you know, two different NAICS, uh, two different NAICS codes, under one, one uh, under one of which you're a large business, and under the other uh, one you're small. Maybe select the the one that you're small under um, as as your primary NAICS code. You also have to include various information about your socioeconomic status, um, uh, your 8A hub zone and WOSB status. Now all require SBA certifications, and so that information should pull directly over from the dynamic small business search system, uh, the DSBS system. Um, SBA populates DSBS, that information gets pulled over into SAM.gov. So that information should automatically populate into 
your SAM.gov profile. For now, you can self-certify as to whether you're an SDVOSB for non-Department of Veterans Affairs work. I mentioned for now because uh, you know, the, the government right now, uh, SBA and, and VA are currently working out a government-wide SDVOSB verification, which will go live at the beginning of 2023. And so for every contract beginning in, uh, in 2023, if you want to do work as an SDVOSB, be it at the VA, DOD, um, you know, uh, wherever, uh, civilian agency, Department of Inter Interior, something, if you want to do work as an SDVOSB, you will have to have a government-wide certification for that from the SBA, and, and, and that information will eventually be automatically pulled over into your SAM.gov profile as well. Everybody's favorite topic, reps and certs, <laughs> representations and certifications. In addition to providing this information to the federal government, you have to certify or make various representations and certifications about the company as well as any of its owners and affiliates. And some of this information is fairly benign. Some of it is, is fairly intense um, and it runs the gamut. You know, it, it, it might take you a few hours to fill out reps and certs. And I recommend that you read each question carefully and, and understand what it means for your business and answer the question, uh, that is asked. You have to identify certain things like the person's responsible for determining your prices, your business's prices, um, including information about other locations for your company, uh, talking about compliance with various regulations. And again, some of these regulations are um, uh, on the intense side. So we could be talking about you know, trade restrictions or, or export control requirements, other things mm -hmm. like that. Other ones are, are, you know, important, certainly, but not as intense, you know, where you're having to say, yes, I'm going to tell my folks not to text and drive, or, um, um, you know, I'm going to uh, uh, not have, not use Kaspersky antivirus software or something like that. Um, so again, read these very carefully. A lot of them will, will refer to other statutes or, or other FAR provisions. And so you can go through and, and you want to make sure that you're answering those questions truthfully and accurately and, and that you understand what is being asked. If you have uh, been excluded, debarred, or suspended, or any of your key personnel have, you'll need to include information about that. If you're subject to any judgments or civil or criminal proceedings, you'll include um, information about that. Various uh, compliances with equal opportunity and affirmative action requirements, you will need to include um, uh, that information. Tax information, if you have outstanding liabilities, uh, the government wants to know about that. And usually what they're talking about are liabilities for which you don't have a payment plan in place. If you have a payment plan in place with the IRS and are making payments on it, you're current on it, generally that's not an issue, generally. Um, if you have outstanding tax liabilities and are not paying them, then the federal government might not want to do business with you. Same as being an inverted domestic corporation. I am not a tax attorney, um, but essentially what an inverted tax or an inverted domestic corporation is, is it's, it's an American company or it's a company based in America, but is registered overseas, a lot of times Ireland. Um, and, and they do it in a goofy way. And essentially it helps that company avoid paying taxes here in the United States. And if you're an inverted domestic corporation, um, the government will not do business with you. Again, the thought process is, well, if you don't want to pay our taxes, we don't want to pay you to contract with us. Um, and so uh, you have to make various certifications about you are not an inverted domestic corporation and you do not have any outstanding tax liabilities. If you have various, um, if you have foreign ownership, any part of foreign ownership uh, owned and controlled by foreign persons or foreign uh, countries, uh, the federal government wants to know that as well. If you uh, you have to make various attestations that you do not do business 
with certain countries, um, you know, uh, these are the countries that you would think the government doesn't want you to do business with the North Koreas, the Irans, the Sudans. I'm not sure if Russia's on that list, um, but various um, uh, countries, you, you have to confirm that you don't do business uh, with any of those companies as well. Rather goofily too, um, if you're Elon Musk, um, this next question, welcome. Um, it, this next question is gonna apply directly to you. Do you shoot satellites into space? The government wants to know about, <laughs> about that. Um, if you shoot satellites into space, same as if you, uh, there's also questions if you, you know, transport goods across the ocean and stuff like that. Um, it, it, the reps and certs, as I mentioned, they are very comprehensive. They are very detailed. They can take a long time to fill out. Um, and so go through, make sure you understand all of the various questions and that you are answering them accurately because you are attesting under penalty of perjury that the information that you have provided is accurate. And if it's not, well, in addition to potentially violating that, um, that requirement, you might also be violating uh, uh, the FAR. Under the FAR, you are required to keep your SAM.gov registration current, accurate, and complete. Um, now, a lot of folks view this as an annual requirement because the FAR says that the, the contractor has to review and update the registration in, uh, annually to make sure it's current, accurate, and complete. And so some folks say, well, I've got to do this annually. I actually view it differently than that. The obligation is to keep it current, accurate, and complete, which means in my mind that you have to review it at least annually to make sure that it is so. But if you're aware of any changes uh, that might affect your SAM.gov <clears throat> SAM profile, you need to be changing those in that process. Or if there's any changes to your reps and certs, you need to be uh, keeping those updated updated at least on uh, an annual basis and know that you are liable for the government's reliance on any information that you put in that SAM.gov profile. And if they rely on it and it's, it's, it's incorrect or it's improper and, and that could give rise um, to liability for the uh, to the federal government for any associated losses uh, with that. So make sure that once you have, once you've gone through the process of creating your SAM.gov profile, um, uh, and and um, uh, you know you've 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 done it, you want to make sure that you're keeping it current, accurate, and complete. No, I I do think that there are uh, some issues with that. We talked about the GSA updates earlier. Um, I think that that continues to be a problem um, as you're updating your information as well. Um, and so you might balance, um, well, you know, is, is my information, you know, uh, current and accurate enough? If I go through this process, am I, am I going to, to, to open myself up for um, uh, you know, delays in my SAM profile. I'm not suggesting that you keep anything inaccurate on there, but of course, this is all part of the calculus that contractors have to weigh when they go through and create and update their SAM.gov profile. So, you know, a few key takeaways when we talk about creating and maintaining uh, your SAM.gov profile, start early, don't delay it, especially now that, that there's all of these issues um, with getting it uh, registered in there, um, uh, you know, as, as far as the um, uh, uh, verifications and everything go, don't, don't start this process, you know, right before you're going to submit a bid. Do it even before you've got a bid identified. Um, if you're joining us today and you don't have a SAM.gov profile, why not? You know, it's free. Um, you can you, you, you can go through that process and then later on, um, once you identify contracts, you've you've got this taken care of. So so start early. Don't don't delay this. Have you know your various information handy um, when you're going through this process. It's going to be much easier if you've kind of considered this. Have as much of that information um, at your fingertips while you're there so you don't have to you know go pause and then go back and then pause and then go back all of that type of stuff take time to answer the question nobody likes filling out their sam.gov registration nobody does 
Um, but nonetheless, you need to take the time to understand what is being asked and then answer that question truthfully. Again, you're attesting to the accuracy of the information. And if you make any um, misrepresentations or false statements, there can be significant penalties to that, you know, criminal liability on there, false claims act, suspension, debarment, all of that type of stuff is possible if you make any misrepresentations or false statements. Um, so please, please, please answer those questions truthfully. And again, update it at least annually to make sure that that information is accurate. Even if nothing has changed, you need to make sure uh, that you're uh, updating your information, you're going through and reviewing it annually um, so that that information is accurate and complete in SAM.gov. So with that, now that we've talked about a little bit about what SAM.gov is in, in getting registered in there, hopefully this next part is, is really important for all of you, and that is how do you use SAM.gov uh, to your benefit when it comes for searching uh, federal contract opportunities? SAM.gov, I think, is, is, is uh, always going to be the starting place for federal contract opportunities. Again, it's, it's the government-wide point of entry for most um, contract opportunities. Not every contract opportunity is going to be listed under there. Certainly, orders that are placed under a multiple award schedule, you're going to want to search GSA's e-library. Um, there are other um, uh, 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 procurements that that uh, maybe go uh, say dibs, um, you know the dibs system, uh, particularly for DLA and some of these other um, procurements. But for the most part, SAM.gov is a good starting point for uh, searching various federal contract opportunities. And in some cases, it might be the ending point for you too. You might be a contractor that that the only things you bid on are those posted to SAM.gov. So you certainly need to be familiar with how the government posts those. Now, I will also note that even before the government posts something to SAM.gov, odds are it's searching the system as part of its market research in determining who is out there, who can do this work. Um, do we need to set this work aside for small businesses or for various socioeconomic programs? They're gonna search for contractors through those various NAICS codes, the NAICS code under which they want to do those work and, and adjoining NAICS codes. And then they're going to say, okay, under this NAICS code, there's, there's X number of businesses who can do this work uh, or say that they do this work. I'm going to send an RFI or source of SOT notice to them. Um, I'm going to uh, um, you know, set this aside because of those you know, 22 businesses, 11 are small businesses, something like that. So, so the agency's market research often begins you know, with SAM.gov, and it might end there too, depending on what that market research reveals. So you wanna make sure that you are strategically uh, putting in those NAICS codes that you think are, are the most relevant to your business. Again, don't list every NAICS code because if I'm a contracting officer and I see that, uh, you know, probably not one that uh, strikes a lot of confidence in me um, if, if companies have every single NAICS code under their SAM profile. But this is where agencies are then going to post uh, solicitation-related information to SAM.gov. Because SAM.gov is the government-wide point of entry, contractors are on constructive notice that that solicitation has been posted once it hits SAM.gov or that those solicitation documents have been posted to SAM.gov. That is, contracting officers don't need to go through and tell every uh, potential offer or everything individually. They can post it to SAM.gov and then interested offerors are put on constructive notice by, uh, by their doing so. And so that's why you need to have different search strategies when it comes to looking for things um, under uh, SAM.gov. So this can be something, you know, you can, you can search for things by solicitation number. If you know that directly, you can search by keyword or by NAICS code. Um, if you're looking for specific industries, you can search by the agency. Hey, you know, maybe uh, the Forest Service is bidding something in the state of Montana, Montana and I need to know what that is because that's my customer. Um, and so I can search um, for forest service opportunities in the state of Montana um, uh, specifically. 
Um, you can also search for opportunities by small business or set aside status. You know, you might say, hey, I, I want to know all of the woman-owned small business construction um, or, or tile flooring contractor opportunities that are out there. Um, and so you can tailor your searches that way. But here's really where I think PTACs um, are invaluable to small business federal government contractors. When it comes to identifying these markets and creating this, 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 this market intelligence, understanding where folks are bidding from, how they're buying, this is something that I think PTACs are worth their weight in gold on because, because this is right in their wheelhouse. And so I, I recommend to folks, go ahead and, and connect with your PTAC, help understand you know, how, they can, uh, how you can search for these uh, procurements on SAM.gov. You can set alerts um, for various uh, types of solicitations or solicitations in locations or by NAICS code or by agency, and that, that it'll update you whenever those things are posted. So keep that in mind as well, and please use SAM.gov to your benefit. So with that, you know, I think that here the goal is to increase your business's visibility to agencies. Um, you know, use NAICS code strategically um, when it comes to identifying your business and what you do, all reasonable NAICS codes um, for your agency. And again, if you have questions about, well, which NAICS codes apply, the starting point, I think, is the NAICS code manual. You can also include various information about your sm uh, small business or socioeconomic status um, information. Again, some will automatically populate but doing so helps agencies with market research. And you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you are, are using searches for specific contracts appropriately so that you are keeping these opportunities visible as you go to bid on, on federal opportunities. Again, since there is award information posted on, on SAM.gov, you know, this might be a good resource to say, hey, here are these contractors that are performing as prime. I have a good relationship with them. Maybe I can get in as a subcontractor on some of their work. So, so use this information strategically in that way, too. You can follow specific opportunities um, uh, for updates. And here you're going to want to know, when are these opportunities going to expire? Um, you know, this information is on SAM.gov. You can also find it on FPDS, you know, that, 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 that fun little website um, about when existing contracts will, will expire. And so you can begin exploring the follow-on requirements for those, um, knowing, you know, hey, the agency is going to want to start bidding this soon. Um, and so I need to be following this solicitation for the recompete. Um, take advantage of interested vendors listings. You can certainly post information about, hey, I'm interested in doing this type of work. Follow sources, SOTs, respond to sources, SOTs, or request for information as well. And so certainly use SAM.gov for your benefit in that way. And with that, I know we're uh, approaching the top of the hour here. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about SAM.gov. My contact information is on the screen. Um, and so if we didn't talk about something today that, that interests you or uh, you don't get your question answered or something pops up later, please feel free to reach out. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, shoot me an email. Give me a call. I'm always happy to reach out to folks um, and, and talk about these issues. So with that, if there are any questions, you know, I'm certainly happy to, uh, to discuss. Thank you, Matthew. That was great. Very comprehensive and really um, incredibly important. As you said, people have been having a lot of issues with SAM.gov and a lot of them are out of our control, even us uh, PTAC. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I would love nothing more from a legal standpoint to be able to tell a client, hey, I have this solution for you to this problem. Unfortunately, I don't, um, because a lot of it is internal kind of GSA stuff. And, and I, you know, I've, I've thought of a harebrained idea to maybe, maybe do something. It's very harebrained. It's not frivolous, but it's very harebrained, and maybe something like that would work. But, it, you know, it, I think uh, a lot of times this is, it, unfortunately, the issue is going to be, well, we just have to wait for GSA to square it away, and until then hope for a little grace from agencies like DOD has given us with the recent class deviation. 
Okay, great. So let's have a look in the chat box and see if there are any questions. You may have answered some of these already um, during your presentation. First one was, how long does it take to be assigned your UEI number? Uh, not not very long as I as 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 I understand that process and and Yasmin, you might know uh, more than I do. Um, but I think that's something that when you go through that process, it shouldn't take very long at all. I don't want to say it's you know, I don't want to say it's automatic or immediate, um, but it it should be pretty quick as far as a it's not an exact timeline. I don't, I don't have an exact timeline, but it, it, it shouldn't be something that takes very long. Okay, great. Um, and yes, of course, your PTAC counselor can give you any updated information on timelines. So please uh, do bear that in mind when you're considering signing up with the PTAC, that these are the kinds of issues that your counselor can help you with. Um, and there only seems to be, okay, another question's come in. Are there problems specific to entities already in SAM that have to re-register this year? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, there are. Um, uh, I think I, I, I don't think this issue is really, uh, you know, sparing anyone. And in fact, a lot of these issues are for companies that are already in SAM.gov, where when the systems go to talk to each other about the, the verifications with them, they're not matching up. Um, and so unfortunately, we are seeing a lot of these these issues pop up um, uh, with folks. If it's affecting you, I would, you know, certainly you want to make sure that you're talking to your contracting officer. Hopefully agencies are figuring out alternative ways to pay folks um, in that case. Uh, but, you know, you want to make sure that you're talking to contracting officers about that process. Okay, somebody's asking, is there a fee for SAM registration? No, no, there is no fee to register or to maintain your registration in SAM. So if anybody tells you there is, that's a scam. Um, so just be aware that there is no fee. Yep. Um, let's see, how do we sign up for PTAC counseling? Just log into, um, you would have had to create a profile to register for this class and they would have given you a password or you would have had to set a password. So just log back in and complete the application form that you'll see there. And then it's taking about 15 days for us to assign a counselor right now. We have a bit of a backlog um, because of the numbers of people wanting help. Um, let's see, I think any... I will say it's a very good thing too, because you know we are seeing you're you're in the right place. Uh, things are hopefully your business is experiencing this as well, but they are are very busy right now with the federal government, um, and so uh, you know connecting with your PTAC, take advantage of that resource. That's that's my number one. You know beyond anything we talked about in Sam today, that's the number one takeaway: is make sure that you're connecting with the PTAC and sitting down with them. Oh, thanks for that, Matthew. Good advice. <laughs> All right. Well, it's 11 o'clock. Sorry, uh, we don't have any more time left, but any of your questions we didn't get to answer, um, as uh, Matthew said, you can either email him or, of course, you can ask your PTAC counsellor and they'll be more than happy to help you. So I'd like to thank Matthew today for a great presentation. He's going to email me the slides and I'll share that with you. And I'd like to thank all of our audience today for asking great questions as well. And we hope to see you at a future PTAC webinar. Thank you, everybody. Y'all have a great day. Bye-bye.